Not only is this equation outrageously offensive due to the use of usury or interest to steal from the poor and give to the rich, but it also perpetuates class stratification by its very design, keeping the lower classes poor under the constant burden of debt and servitude while keeping the upper classes rich with no means to, uh, excuse me, with the means to simply turn excess money into more money. The very idea that you can take money and turn it into more money is absolutely hilarious and corrupt. Likewise, it should be no surprise that the world is run by cartels and government collusion. For competition is based on nothing more than a gaming strategy, as we, gaming strategy, as we have said. In other words, competition breeds corruption. This is another one of those economist things where they say, oh, the free market used to be great, but something happened and now we have all these cartels. Now, monopoly is the final stage of success in a competitive environment. It is incredible to, me, incredible to be how people don't realize this. It doesn't matter how much legislation that you have to combat, combat sector or industry dominance, it will keep occurring. Even more powerfully, government coercion by big business is also unstoppable. It is a natural progression of market strategy to get government on your side. In fact, the true propensity of our world economic system continually year by year approaches one thing, fascism or more specifically, inverted fascism. This is the condition where corporations covertly control government policy. This is the natural gravitation. So as time continues to move forward and you keep looking back, it seems like things always get worse, and they do. And this leads me to part two, culture and the biosocial imperative. So this is a detour now. I hope that first section, uh, if you have any questions, keep them in mind when we go to the Q&A. In this section, we are going to address some issues regarding, um, regarding our physical and social selves. This is very, very relevant to me, and I think very relevant to, to the whole argument. And unfortunately, again, most never think about this subject at all. In order for us to consider routes of social change, we must also have a clear understanding of conditioning, our biology, and our relationship to the environment. As denoted before, when it comes to the pursuits of social change, the most profound hurdle is overcoming the traditional ideology, identifications, and dogmas which have been set in stone as final by the established culture. Of these ideas, a consistent one that comes up has to do with the conclusion that the human being is of a rigid, fixed nature, whereas certain behaviors are simply immutable. Therefore, as the logic goes, social structures are locked into a set pattern which cannot be overcome due to the very nature of the species. In order to address this claim, we need to first consider the ramifications of culture itself. The word culture in a social sense is defined as a set of shared attributes, values, goals, and practices that characterizes an institution, organization, or group. The most obvious yet often overlooked example of the mechanics of culture is the fact that we are provably shaped by the sort of society we live in. The language you use, the gaming strategies you execute for survival, the perception of beauty you lust for, the familial patterns and traditions you perpetuate, and the deeply held theology, myths, and urban legends that define your broadest view are all examples of the qualities you might absorb arbitrarily from the culture you have been born into. In fact, if you dig deeper, you find that there is really nothing that we cognitively think and believe which isn't first presented to us in some environmental form. An insulted man who pulls out a gun and shoots somebody had to learn at some point in his life what a gun was, how to pull the trigger, along with what he was to find insulting to begin with. Every word that I am saying has been learned one way or another. Every concept relayed is a collective accumulation of experience. A Chinese baby taken at birth and raised in a British family in England will develop the language, dialect, mannerisms, traditions, and accent of the British culture. Needless to say, it is obvious the profound effect the environment has on behavior. But that's only part of the equation, for we are obviously biologically defined as well. It doesn't matter how much time I try to condition a cat to learn to speak English, it simply can't simply due to the limitations of its evolutionarily derived biological state. Those, those limitations are basically defined by genes. 
genes are a fairly recent discovery, and there has been a great deal of speculation as to the uh, spectrum that genes hold, excuse me, the spectrum of relevance that genes hold. The most contentious is in the realm of behavioral biology. This is a field dedicated to understanding how genetics influences behavior. The idea that genetics are the possible source of various behaviors became popular in about the 19th century. One of the first pursuits that emerged was the idea that the aberrancies of human behavior, such as criminality, could be explained by a person's genes. You know, the old criminal gene idea. Sickly enough, even eugenics operations in the form of sterilization took place many years ago in an attempt to rid society of, quote, criminals, idiots, imbeciles, and rapists. The implication is that certain people are naturally, quote, bad people due to their genetics. You see this rhetoric everywhere. Someone might say, he has bad blood, or she's just an evil person. As an aside, I find it fascinating that this simplistic social fallback to explain a person's behavior is in full accord with the primitive superstitious duality postulated by nearly all established religions, good and evil. The gene in this case has been replaced has replaced the satanic demon that once possessed a person, and thus the person has no control over their evil, evil actions. In other words, they are slaves to their genes. Well, as research has progressed, it has been found that genes do nothing of the sort. Genes are stretches of DNA that produce proteins, which of course are vital to the operation of the brain, the nervous system, and the whole body. However, they are not autonomous initiators of commands. They do not cause behaviors in any real sense of the idea. In the words of professor of biology and neurology at Stanford University, and a well-known anthropologist as well, Dr. Robert Sapolsky, genes are rarely about inevitability, especially when it comes to humans, the brain and behavior. They're about vulnerability, propensities, and tendencies. As it turns out, the determining factor of genetic propensities, particularly in the realm of behavior, is the environment that the organism resides in. For example, recent research has shown that a gene could exist for depression. However, just because you have that gene does not mean you're going to get depressed. It takes some form of dramatic environmental stressor to trigger the genetic response, such as a sudden death of a loved one or something very severe. In other words, the environment triggers the existing genetic propensity. Even with a genetic predisposition to a particular illness, there is no guarantee you're going to get it. A chair with a broken leg is not dangerous if you never sit on it. As a variation of this, it is interesting to know how the environment even affects broad physiological attributes, a realm traditionally left for the genetic side of the nature and nurture debate. A study was done a few years ago at the Miami School of Medicine with premature infants in neonatology wards, where they decided to simply touch a section of the infants in the wards a few times a day while the other section was not touched. All feeding patterns were made alike, everything else equal. As it turned out, the infants that were touched grew 50% faster and were noticeably more healthy. They were released from the hospital a week early. When compared months later, these same kids showed better health and agility than those that were not touched. It's incredible. It's a dramatic finding on many levels for it shows that the genetically prescribed growth hormone release can be profoundly influenced by a simple and subtle environmental experience. 